Salma Bashir, co-authors Greta Binford, Pamela Zobelthrop, and uh, Matthew Corday, Sequence Determinants of Substrate Specificity in Brown Recluse Spider Toxins. They're all from Lewis and Clark College. Take it away, Salma. Thank you. Oh, okay, there you are. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. And your screen is good to go. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm happy to be here as well. Uh, today, I'll be talking about some of the research we've been doing on brown recluse venom toxins. So we're all enticed into arachnology because of the wonderful biodiversity of these animals. But we can also be inspired by biodiversity at a molecular scale, as seen by these proteins, which have many beautiful and diverse phenotypes. And the biodiversity of spiders in particular is expanded by the diversity of molecules within their venom. This is a venom gland as well as a cartoon representation. And we use the analogy that venom is a cocktail of different molecules, including small organic compounds, peptides, and proteins. Venomous creatures, of course, use their toxins primarily to immobilize their prey. This here is a brown recluse feeding on a cricket that's almost larger than itself. And these spiders are generalist foragers feeding primarily on soft-bodied insects and their venom contains potent neurotoxins. The venom of brown recluse spiders is also pretty notorious for its ability to cause dermonecrosis in humans as seen in this picture. And the toxins that are responsible for these symptoms are called Sictox, which is short for Sicariidae toxins. And they're an abundant component in the venom of brown recluse spiders. So this is an outline of what the rest of this talk will entail. And I'll begin with an introduction on Sictox specifically. So Sictox proteins are phospholipases, meaning that they target the cell membranes of cells. And if we zoom in on that membrane, we can see that it's a lipid bilayer composed of molecules called phospholipids that have a polar head group and fatty acid tails. And Sictox proteins will cleave that polar head group from the tails, which disrupts membrane organization, which is detrimental to both the cell and the organism where that cell resides. Interestingly, there are different types of phospholipids that make up cell membranes throughout different organisms. We focus primarily on two. The first is sphingomyelin and ceramide phosphoethanolamine. And you can see that their structures are quite similar, except for their head groups. Sphingomyelin has a choline head group, and CBE has an ethanolamine head group. And even more interestingly, these Sictox proteins have actually evolved to act on different phospholipids in varying manners. So the Sictox gene family is incredibly diverse. Dr. Binford and colleagues have worked to categorize this family into two venom express clades. The first is alpha in red and beta in blue. And this family also contains non-venom express members in black here at the bottom. Many of these Sictox proteins have also been characterized for phospholipid specificity. Laz alpha from the Loxosceles arizonica spider prefers SM over CPE phospholipids. Laz beta, which is amazingly from the exact same spider, is, can act on both SM and CPE. And ST beta from the Sicarius terosus spider prefers CPE over SM. So this work takes a more zoomed in focus on what evolutionary changes have occurred in these proteins that account for their differences in specificity. And we focus, in order to answer this question, we focus primarily on two different regions of the protein that could influence these changes. And the first is the active site, which is specifically involved in catalysis or cleavage of the polar head groups from the tails. And the second is the binding site, which is hypothesized to be involved in attaching to the membrane. So these are two distinct functions, which is important to remember as we move forward. The structure of some of these Sictox proteins has also been solved. And we can see that they're the ubiquitous Tim barrel protein structure. They have eight alpha helices and eight beta sheets forming a barrel. 
The active site is located just in the middle of that barrel in these yellow residues, and the binding site is located just underneath near this catalytic loop. Ziktox structure and active site is also shown to be highly conserved among both alpha and beta proteins, as you can see on the superposition of two alpha clade proteins and one beta clade protein, as well as the superposition of the active site residues of all three of these proteins. So more specifically, we're trying to uncover which amino acids have changed to account for specificity towards different phospholipids. And we can begin to answer this question through comparative analysis of amino acid sequences or by generating alignments. And you can see here an alignment of alpha clade proteins and beta clade proteins. And many of these residues are highly conserved among all of these proteins, including those involved in catalysis, which are outlined in red, in ion coordination, outlined in green, as well as in the formation of disulfide bonds, which is of course important for protein structure and stability, outlined in yellow. Many of the residues in the active site have been targeted for mutagenesis. And it's, it, when these uh, residues are changed, it seems to completely kill protein activity but doesn't necessarily change specificity from one phospholipid to another. And so we look towards the binding site as another possible candidate. In alpha clade proteins, they have a highly conserved aromatic cage located in the binding site. And that's characterized by these large bulky ring structures that form a cage. And importantly, this cage, the conservation of the cage is much more variable within beta clade proteins as seen right here, an ST beta protein. And the conserved aromatic cage, given that it's highly conserved in alpha clade proteins, which are shown to be specific towards SM, makes it a great candidate for conferring specificity towards SM within these proteins. So how can we test this hypothesis? So I've chosen a candidate protein to be tested called LL-alpha-31i from Loxosceles laeta, which is the Chilean brown recluse spider. And a number of uh, things make this a great candidate protein to be tested for it's, it's been structurally characterized, which is helpful for these kinds of studies. And it comes from one of the most dangerous and potent brown recluse spiders, which makes it medically relevant. So this is an outline of the methodology that we've used to begin answering this question. And I'll expand briefly on mutagenesis as well as how we test for protein activity while cloning, expressing, and purifying these proteins follows standard protocol. So we use a technique called site-directed mutagenesis to target the aromatic cage in this alpha protein. And we have changed them to those residues that are present in ST beta, which is a CPE specific protein. Once we clone, express, and purify both a wild type alpha protein and a mutant protein, we can test for activity. And we would predict that a wild type protein would have high activity on SM and low activity on CPE, whereas a mutant protein would have low activity on SM and potentially high activity on CPE given that the residues in the cage were changed to those present in a CPE-specific protein. And we test for protein activity using fluorescence assays. We incubate the protein of interest, either wild-type or mutant, with the phospholipid, either SM or CPE. And if there is catalysis or cleavage, the head group will go through a series of reactions to produce a final product called resorufin. And the fluorescence of this product can be measured as an indication of protein activity. So the more pink it is, the more active the protein. So this is a graph of SM activity of our controls as well as the wild type and the mutant protein. And to orient you on the Y axis is fluorescence, which is relative to protein activity. And on the x-axis, we have time in minutes. And as you can see, the wild-type alpha protein has a pretty rapid incline in activity that peaks at around 18,000 units. 
whereas the mutant protein seems to have a much slower and steady incline in activity that eventually reaches almost the exact same height, but after a much longer period of time. So it has slower activity. And importantly, all of our controls are working as expected. LAS alpha has high activity on SM as well as LAS beta. ST beta, our CPE specific protein, doesn't show any activity on SM and our blink is close to zero. This is a similar graph except for activity on CPE phospholipids. Once again, the y-axis is fluorescence relative to activity and time in minutes. And both the wild type and the mutant protein were tested at three different concentrations of 0.5, 2.5, and 5 because we really wanted to ensure that any activity on CPE could be detected. And as you can see, neither the wild type nor the mutant protein demonstrates any activity on CPE um, at any of these concentrations. And once again, our controls are working as expected. ST beta, a CPE specific protein, has high activity and lab data also has detectable activity. And this here is just a zoomed in version of the same data so that we can clearly see that both the wild type and mutant protein at all these concentrations have little to no activity on CPE and are actually less than the blink. So. So the results overall suggest that while the mutant is still active on SM, it has some reduced and slower activity. Um, so the aromatic cage likely plays a role in SM activity, but it's not the sole contributor. And we also did not see a switch in SM activity to CP CPE activity, meaning that there are likely other regions of the protein which are important for this kind of specificity. But these results don't necessarily tell us if changes in activity are due to changes in catalysis or changes in binding. And so we hope to conduct binding assays to assess if the mutant protein is still able to bind to the membrane as compared to the wild type. And where do the differences in activity rise from? Well, why does this research matter? Well, the Sigtox proteins are a really wonderful example of the diversity of molecular phenotypes. And the um, study of these proteins may give us insight into bi the biological relevance to these spiders. Phospholipid compositions among organisms vary greatly, including in the prey organisms of these spiders. So how does this play a role to their feeding and how does it play a role in the overall evolutionary story of these proteins? And finally, given the fact that these proteins are specific to cell surfaces, makes them an excellent tool to study and probe these, um, which it can give us a lot of insight into membrane organization, um, which is a very interesting field of research. I'd like to thank everyone who made this project possible. My PIs, Dr. Binford, Dr. Zobel Fraub, and Dr. Cordes from the University of Arizona. My mentors, Lewis Clark Biology Department and the National Science Foundation for their funding. Thank you. Thank you, Salma. And thank you for staying on time. Um, do we have uh, any questions for Salma? <laughs> you're getting a lot of compliments, but you're not getting too many questions. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a great talk. Okay, um, Shama. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, I, Dr. J. Dharamraj from India. Um, uh, your presentation is really nice, but uh, uh, I have only one question. Totally, how many species you were analyzed for uh, Vanamas and uh, phylogenetic tree analysis? Totally, how many species you are taken? For this study? Yeah. So the protein that was tested was only from one species, the Loxosceles laetus spider. Um, but in our lab, we study a few different species from the same family.
Okay.